In today's show, we're talking NBA draft with Derek Murray of Babcock Hoops. We're talking Isaiah Stewart. We're talking Cole Anthony, Grant Rilla, among others, Michael Bolton. Let's get to it. To it. Let's get to it. Indeed. You are locked on fantasy basketball. Your daily fantasy basketball podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and at Yahoo Sports Australia. And you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore B-Ball and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. As I said, we're talking to Derek Murray today. We've got a lot of players to talk about. Isaiah Stewart, Jay Scrub, Cole Anthony, Taylor Melodon, Grant Rilla and Zeke Naji. They're the guys we're going to be talking about in today's show. So let's waste no more time and let's get Derek in to talk about those players. Well, so let's bring in Derek now. Uh, Derek, good to have you on the show. Josh, thank you so much, man. I always enjoy talking about draft prospects. And hey, we're almost at uh, two weeks until we get to have the big day. So it's exciting for everybody. Yeah, the countdown is on. It's been a very, very long time to get here. But we are, we're here. We've had a lot of time to obsess over prospects and look at different flaws and parts of their game. We're going to talk about some guys we maybe don't get covered quite as much in other areas. We're going to cuz we we're going deep on this podcast cuz we've got plenty of time to, to do that. And what I did is that everyone knows I asked all of these people coming in, give me some prospects that you're higher on and some that you're lower on than guys uh, maybe consensus around the NBA and the NBA scouting world. World I asked that same question to Derek and the one that he gave us to kick things off was Isaiah Stewart of Washington, a six foot nine center. I, I'm pretty sure he's a center. You might disagree on that. There's, there's some sites that list him as a power forward. He's 19 years of age. He averaged over two blocks a game, 17 points per game. Now this is going to be an interesting discussion because I am not high on Isaiah Stewart at all. So first of all, I want to know when you say you're higher on him, the consensus, where are we talking? Top 20, top 30, top 50? Like where are you placing Stewart in terms of how you view him as a prospect? So with Stewart, I really like him in that 15 to 20 range as far as big board. You know, when it comes to trying to place him in a mock draft, specifically that's tough because, you know, not every team values centers or power forwards, you know, these big guys, you know, the same anymore. So the value is, is changing depending on who's at a certain spot. But I think talent-wise, he's a top 20 guy for me, you know, 6'9", 250. And the thing with him is that, it's not always going to be pretty, but he is a bruiser. He's going to be the guy that over the course of a game can have a huge impact for you. Um, incredibly strong, um, incredible motor, runs the floor hard. You know, he scored 17 points a game, had nine boards, and he's a decent rim protector as well. I think with the combine, his arms measured at 7'4", if I remember reading that yep, correctly. Yeah, I read that too. Um, in the notes we were sent. So, again, like he's long, he's powerful. And, you know, even though the scoring isn't the prettiest, I, I buy him as a – formidable jump shooter moving forward not you know by any means like a stretch five you know hitting a whole bunch of threes but again i think he'll he'll shoot from the perimeter at a respectable level um and then when we interviewed him as well just a phenomenal kid like, it's a pleasure to talk to he's got a perfect balance of killer as well as like humility and confidence and that's rare from a prospect of his age. So just kind of the whole package. I, I really like Isaiah Stewart. Yeah, so he's he is young, as you mentioned. He won't be turning 20 until May next year. So that's that's a tick in his box. Um, what you said about the offensive game not being pretty is pretty accurate because you go watch his clips. There's a lot of these weird over-the-shoulder left-hand scoops that he seems to do a lot, a lot of weird hook shots, um, a lot of sort of getting you know, really underneath the guy guarding him for lob passes over the top, which I'm not sure is going to necessarily fly in the NBA. But you mentioned the jump shooting, and that's interesting. He took 23s only. That's it. Hit five of them. That's a terrible... It's, it's low volume. It's low percentage. But that's not what I want to talk about because out of his 200 free throw attempts, he hit over 150 of them. That's 77%. And that is usually a good indicator from a guy that, you could become a three-point shooter, but at least is decent enough on his jump shots. Is how can we? How far can we expect him to take that game out? Can he ever become a guy that attempts two to three threes per game and hits him at thirty-five percent? Because it feels like there's a little bit of that there. Right, and and if you buy Stewart, that is the volume that you're going to buy. Because like you said, he didn't really attempt many, and Washington didn't ask him to. That wasn't a part of their game plan. They wanted him as the sole guy owning the paint in you know, in the way they ran their offense. So they never even really wanted him outside. But yeah, the free throw percentage, uh, nice high release point. 
and and it's smooth like it's pretty i just like you said at mid 30s percent that's a number that you can't just completely forget about him and leave him uh, on the perimeter he's not going to be a liability you know with stewart i don't need him to be an elite three-point shooter but yeah i, I think within a couple of years at the nba level he'll be able to step out and hit a couple what do we make of the other parts of his game? Um, from watching him and the assist numbers are really low, like ball movement stuff doesn't appear to be great. Like what's he like in an offense where yeah, he's not going to be getting any, really anything more than, than putbacks and your know, little cheap shots most of the time around the room. He's never going to be a high usage sort of guy. Does he have some ball movement ability? What's his passing? What's his vision like? Right. So he's, he's not a great passer at this point, just very average. You know, there's not, it's not a part of his game where I throw up huge red flags, but by no means, you know, Vernon Carey is a guy who we watch him pass out of the pose and it's really, really nuts. You know, I don't think you're going to get that with Stewart right now. You also don't pick him early in this draft to be, to your point, a high offensive usage guy. You pick him to play the role of um, rim protector, some interior scoring, occasionally stepping out and hitting a shot but your, your high motor, your energy big, that kind of impacts the game physically down low on both ends. So I would never draft him anticipating, hey, this is going to be a super high usage guy. Uh, like you said, the, the assist numbers, they really weren't great. I think he averaged actually just under one per game. Yes, so 0.8. by no means was it flashy at all. Um, but I don't think that's going to be his role either. So I don't look at it as a huge red flag. What about defensively? Like the, the block numbers are strong. You know, 2.1 2 a game is a pretty good number. But I think there has to be some level of concern about his overall defense uh, in the NBA, like in terms of defensive IQ and positioning. Um, even at his size, now the wingspan is is good, but is he going to be a, a rim protector at 6'9"? Um, and how does the rest of his defense look? How's he going to go on a switch or getting out to three-point shooters? On defense, I really like to look at him as a possible Montrezl Harrell type player for me. Um, the Washington zone, they almost ran a 4-1. They had their wings so high that they just completely left Stewart on an island by himself multiple times over the course of games this year. You know, if the ball went into the corner at all, they basically relied on him. If that wing didn't come down, he was running corner to corner at times. And that's just not what I want him to do. When we talked to him, it was actually really interesting he said, you know, I played this zone at Washington, but people forget that when I'm playing man defense in my high school tape and my AU tape and stuff, he said, I dominated people. And it's true. When he's able to get one-on-one -on -one in the post, he is incredibly difficult to score on. One-on-one -on -one in the perimeter, um, very flexible, gets down in his stance, powerful body, good feet. And with his length, I think he'll be able to stop ball handlers from penetrating the lane, at least at will. Um you know, that, that's the thing. We just didn't get to see enough of that that I don't think people realize he can do that if you don't dive into his high school film very much. So it was actually really interesting when he brought that up himself because I hadn't gone back and watched much of his high school tape. But I think defensively he's going to be fine. There are some questions with his, uh, you know, vertical jump, uh, sometimes in traffic, especially off of um, a standstill, you know, getting up quickly. There's some load time issues there. But again, the, the competitor in him, I, I don't worry about the defense too much just because of what he was asked to do and a lot of the spots he was put in uh, in college. Yeah, well, I, I definitely haven't watched his high school high school film, so I'm going to have to look at that as well because if it's uh, markedly different to the college stuff, that is, that is pretty interesting. Now, the other guy you wanted to talk about as a player you're higher on is someone that there are going to be plenty of people uh, listening to this show who have never heard of Jay Scrub a 6'6", 20-year-old shooting guard that played for Logan. He averaged 22 points per game. Um Okay, sell me on Scrub. I had him in my latest mock draft at some point in the second round, early second round, a guy that's getting a little bit of uh, hype at the moment, but he's coming from a you know, quite a low level here, but it was, was really dominant. And I think one of the main selling points for me with him, the shooting, yeah, I think that can be okay, but it's it just hyper-athleticism from Scrub. Yeah, so Scrub is one of those guys, and honestly, I, I think you know, mid second, maybe where he ends up going. I've, we've been told by some people that they like him anywhere from early twenties to late thirties. Like he's got a very wide range because to your point, some people, you don't know what you're going to get with him yet, but we were with him in Atlanta for some pre-draft workouts. And when you walk into the gym, I mean, just what, what his level of athleticism he has just naturally pops immediately. You walk in, he's a legitimate six foot six, six ten wingspan. Uh, bouncy off of one foot, off of two feet. Like, it's just elevating is easy for him in all capacities. Has an incredible raw talent um, and a beautiful, beautiful lefty stroke. 
the issue with him that we saw when we saw him play five on fives at the skill factory there was just the nature of play like just simply playing the game you know he was getting beat on cuts both in front of him and back door you know simply playing in a system where he's no longer able to out athlete all of his competition that is what's going to take a while with scrub i do not worry about him physically i don't worry about him as a scorer because i think he can get his own shot at all levels on the floor it's simply you know how how much discipline are we going to have to instill especially as a defender you know he's been the best player on his team for years and he was able to out athlete, you know, like like I said, a lot of guys to, at the JUCO level. So I think that's what's going to take some time, probably some time in the G League, maybe a year, um, maybe more, depending on what system he goes into and what their NBA roster looks like. But you take him on upside and the skill that he's just that is just innate to him and his basketball game. So what's the best case scenario for Scrub? The name that immediately would come to my mind is a really, really best case and probably never get there is is Zach Levine, that guy who's a scorer, who struggles a lot defensively, struggles with some of his passing and his vision, but a guy that, that can score and is obviously hyper-athletic. Now, getting to that level is going to be a, a tough thing, but that's maybe the sort of player I see in Scrub. Others, you could look at maybe like a Gerald Green type of player. Is that sort of what his best role is going to be if he just can still use that athleticism to, to finish at the rim and the shooting remains where it was, uh, I think, in his first season um, at uh, at Juco where he shot, what, 46%? He only went down to 33% last year. Is that the sort of player archetype we're looking at? Yeah, and what, what it's going to come down to as far as what he develops into is how much he wants to play on the ball or an NBA team wants to use him on the ball. You know, to your point, he shot, you know, mid 40% from three his first year, John Logan. And I, you know, I talked to him and his agent and trainer about the drop off in this second year. And basically what it was is he was on ball way more creating for himself um, and just putting the team on his shoulders at times. So the fact that he has showed great efficiency off the ball, shooting off of screens, um, coming off of curls and pin downs. And then this year developing more comfortability with the ball in his hands, almost as a point guard, like the ability to do all that is what makes him really intriguing. You know, I don't know if, I don't think he'll ever be a one at the NBA level. That's not his thing, but is he a two, three, is he a three, two? The fact that we don't know makes him intriguing to teams because he has the skill set for both. So I think Levine, again, as like a crazy, super high ceiling, is at least an archetype to look at for him uh, because of that just raw athleticism and having to put some pieces together. But as far as a scorer in, in high volume, you might get there one day. A couple of guys that we're going to talk about here that you're a little bit lower on the consensus. is The first one of those is Cole Anthony. I've talked about him in one of the previous podcasts. He's obviously a point guard, 6'3", from North Carolina. Had some struggles with North Carolina this year. I think, I think some of that is to do with his or the spacing and the, the players around him. Um, someone brought up a good point to me in terms of facilitating that you know, the low assist numbers aren't necessarily a death now. Guys like Kyle Lowry and Damian Lillard put up pretty low assist numbers in college and they were able to get better at that at an NBA level. But why are you... Why are you down on Anthony? Where are you looking at him in terms of value? Because he's been you know, talked about from a maybe maybe top 12 guy to top 16. Are you like, how much lower are you there than uh, on Cole Anthony? Yeah, for sure. And, and like the other people you've talked to, I am not going to hold his low assist numbers against him. There were games at North Carolina where he would have been better off kicking it to me on the perimeter and having me shoot. So <laughs> I, the, the, the talent around him at times really hurt him. And again, the spacing, uh, the players he was kicking to on the perimeter, I don't want to hold that against him because he can be an offensive engine for somebody uh, if that's what he's asked to do. He's really athletic. A lot of my concerns are not basketball related. And for those, we actually have him mocked. We updated it yesterday and we have him at 21 to Philadelphia. Um, I think, you know, through a lot of our conversations with teams and we've heard from people around the league that there are a handful of point guards who are ranked above him on people's boards. Um, and, and it's as much to do with, not basketball related issues as it is the game itself. Um, you know, in traffic, I worry about the explosiveness. I worry about, you know, his ability to get the shot off, at least in some capacity at the NBA level. But again, he showed that he can score in volume. He hit 35% of his threes. A lot of times were bailout threes because he didn't want to kick it to teammates, understandably. Hit 75% of his free throws. I think he'll be able to drive an offense, just not at like an elite caliber level that some other people uh, think he will. So it's still comfortably like a top 25 guy in our mind. But when you really take in the whole picture and what you're bringing into an organization, we have him more towards the 20s. 
So I had him at 16 in my last mock, but sort of at the back end of that first range of point guards. You know, I've had him uh, you know, behind guys like you know, Tyrese Maxey and RJ Hampton and Halliburton, those sort of players. But then there's a bunch of point guards here that go later. You've got guys like Malachi Flynn, Tyrell Terry, if you count him as a point guard. Like, do you have him lower than those players? So in, in our recent mock, we have Malachi Flynn one spot ahead of him. Okay. Uh, but we actually have Terry and Maxey behind him. Okay. Um, yeah, so Flynn is just a guy that we've really come to like during this process, both during the year and in the pre-draft. So we're, we're, we're very high on Flynn. Um, but again, Colt, I mean, I think he's, he's got a wide range because some people love him. Uh, some people honestly are going to prefer to stay away from him, even if they want a point guard. So it'll be really fascinating to see where he falls. Yeah, I, he's one of those players that I'm getting completely wide-ranging opinions on just p- scouts and people who just, you know, casual watchers. It's all over the place for him. And I honestly wouldn't be surprised with any outcome for Cole Anthony at this point. The other guy that you want to talk about is being a little bit lower on is Teo Maladon. Uh, of course, the French point guard, 6'5", 19 years of age, played for Asval. Seven and a half points a game, 2.7 assists. Of course, that's in real low minutes, 17 minutes a night across uh, all competitions, 33% shooting from three. Um, uh, he, he's mostly a guy that's that back end first round player, early second round sort of a guy. He's a, again, he's like so many players in this class. It's really hard to understand how they're going to fit. There's so many weaknesses with these guys without those real elite talents. I, I worry a little bit about yeah, his his shooting numbers uh, defensively. I, I have concerns there. I want to see if they marry up exactly with yours. Yeah. So. Again, we have him early second round, so I feel like that's right for for Maladon. What it is for me is I don't know if he has what it takes to be a long-term starter. I think what you're getting is a solid, reliable backup point guard, you know, maybe for many, many years at the NBA level. But I just don't see him becoming that long-term starter for somebody like some other people do. And my big issue with him is, you know, the measurables are good. You know, he measured, I believe, you know, 6'4", 6'5", without shoes. So that, that checks out. Decent length as well. When he's passing the ball, when he's getting downhill, I've noticed when I watch a lot of his film that he picks the ball up. Like one of the reasons I love Kyra Lewis Jr. is because his live dribble passing is is awesome. You know, either hand, either direction, doesn't matter. Like full speed on the move, he can whip it to anywhere on the floor he wants. For Maladon, it feels like he has to stop. And whether or not, if that's just because he doesn't see the floor at a, at a speed, which is going to be required at the NBA level, whether that's because the game just maybe moves a little bit fast for him because he's a young guy playing against grown men in professional basketball. You know, maybe it's one of those, but I just think he's a backup. I don't think he's going to drive an offense and become a long-term starter on a, on a championship level team moving forward. So I, I pick him in, in the second round, uh, early second for sure. And, and just pick him as somebody safe. Um, so again, it's not that I'm like anti Maladon at all. I'm just, I'm just not first round high on him. Like, like a lot of media outlets are. Yeah. I had him, I think 25, maybe let me have a quick look at 27 uh, going to the Knicks there. But I agree. I don't really see him as a, any sort of long-term starter upside. I worry a bit about, you know, him running an offense. I think the passing's fine, but being that uh, guy that uh, is you know, creating his own shots, I, I worry a little bit about that. The shooting numbers haven't been great, uh, just 33%. Although the year before he shot at 39%. Um, so where he fits there, I think is going to be a big determiner. Like if he can be a 40% three-point shooter and then run as a backup point guard, I think there's value in that. But there's also a chance that someone you know, very similar and mainly because they're French, but uh, Ali Okobo, who came across, came across with some pretty good shooting upside and hasn't really panned out for him in the NBA. And I think Maladon, there's a risk of it going that way for him at, at this point. A um, couple other guys that we want to talk about here. Grant Rilla, a... Yeah, shooting guard, I guess is probably the best way of describing him. 6'3", but but he's old. He's 23 years of age. He averaged 22 points per game playing for Charleston. Um, A a guy that uh, shot 36% from three, uh, 50% overall from the field, averaged almost 1.6 steals. The numbers are really impressive for Rilla, but the age is the concern. Um, And I guess it's the lower level of competition as well. How do you view Rilla? Uh, I've got him in the early to mid 20s as just a guy that can come in and you know, perhaps almost immediately be a bench scoring guard in a Jordan Clarkson sort of role. Do you see higher upside than that? Do you see that he, that scoring just not translating? So, I think he's I, I think he's more likely to be a 
uh, early to mid second rounder for somebody, okay. you know, partially the age, partially that he has uh, torn ACL in his past and he's listed as six, three. And one thing that was really fascinating is that for his combine measurements, he actually came in under six foot one. And that is something that I think as far as evaluation and, and draft stock will end up hurting him. You know, there's no question that he's one of the most potent scorers in this class. And, you know, if you're a team at the back end of the first or early second and you need to win right now and there's a place for you, then, you know, I, I can see where that would work. Um, you know, 31 to Dallas could make sense. Either of the 34 or 36 pick at Philly, you know, both of those can make a ton of sense because he's going to come in and he's going to give you that scoring pop right now. What could make him slip is teams looking to build for the future with an 18, 19, or 20-year-old. And that's not, again, an indicative of being a negative on his game whatsoever. It's, to your point, it's, it's just the age. Uh, that's why I think he'll end up slipping a little bit, not necessarily because of his game. Yeah, the age is obviously a concern, and that's going to be something that's into consideration. So I think the Philadelphia one makes sense. I had him going to Miami, I think, in my mock team, obviously, that was in the NBA Finals and has had some success with older rookies like Hendrick Nunn, with Duncan Robinson mm -hmm. as well, a guy that can come in and just be someone that, that can contribute as a bench scorer straight away. And it is going to be really important to me with, with what team he goes to in terms of fit. I don't really see him as a long-term starter, but as a, a rotational piece who can come in and provide some of that scoring. The last guy is someone you really, you, uh, you messaged me, you go, hey, can I talk about this guy? And I went, absolutely. And that is Zeke Naji from Arizona, a 6'11 center, 19 years of age. He averaged 16 and almost nine rebounds uh, in, his, uh, in his one season at college. The block numbers are comically low, really, for a center. 0.9 blocks per game is really low. So, okay, I'll give you the floor. You just tell me what you want to tell me about Zeke. You're good. So Zeke is a guy that... Um, just continues to rise on our boards and also in the minds of teams as well. Um, measured at impact basketball in Las Vegas at 6'11", 247. Just has gotten himself in tremendous shape, a tremendous frame, wide shoulders, and can, is putting on muscle like crazy. And what he's showing us is that he can shoot. You know, Arizona didn't want him to stretch the floor on offense. It's just not the role they put him in. They didn't ask him to do it. They didn't let him do it, any of that stuff. But he actually won a three-point contest in high school going into college. You know, that's a part of his game. That's something he's comfortable doing. You go to impact, and he's hitting threes in four-on-fours. He's just continuing to nail them in these drills. Uh, mechanics are good, high release point. Like, it just looks easy to him, and he's comfortable. So some bigs, if you want to stretch them on the floor, you almost have to retrain them. And for him, it's just a part of who he is. You just have to let him do that. So I really like Zeke because I think he can play the four – or the five at the NBA level with his strengths being more on the offensive end uh, than the defensive. Okay, so what do, we, what do we make of those really low block numbers? Is he, is he that bad of a defender? No, I think his wingspan isn't nearly as long um, as I think some people would want their centers to be. You know, one of the reasons we really love Stewart is because he's got that length that allows him to protect the rim. And Najee, I, I forget what his wingspan measured in at. I think it was like seven one, maybe seven foot. Again, I just don't think that's going to be a huge part of his game. Um, he's a really great kid. He's really personable. There are times that on the defensive event, I wonder if he has that killer instinct to be an elite shot blocker like Stewart and some of these other bigs. So I think that plays into it as well. Um, it's definitely something to look at. It's definitely something to monitor if you need a defensive big. But again, I think he'll be able to provide enough scoring punch on the offensive end for you down the road. And that's why I really like him. Okay, so in the past, we've heard narratives coming out of Arizona about guys like Aaron Gordon, uh, DeAndre Aiden. Oh, well, the de their defensive numbers are low because of the scheme that was run. But those guys really haven't put up big defensive numbers when they've entered the NBA either. It's, it's sort of yeah, it's tied into what they've done in college. And I think there could be a similar sort of problem happening with Najee. Now, the issue I have there is that the game's going to be run on his offense. How, yeah, how important are teams viewing center offense as a guy? that The shooting could be really interesting, but... If he cannot provide that defensive value, like where does he fit as a current Ennis Cantor, 18 minute off the bench roll? I know they're very different players, but yeah, offense only center, or can he get to an offense only center like you mentioned, name you mentioned earlier, like Montrez Harrell, who plays really no defense, but yeah, is there as, as an offensive guy to use in that second unit and, and plays 25, 26 minutes? So I think, you know, a lot of teams value offense especially shooting from a big so much now just because of how spaced out the nba is getting that there are some organizations who are almost willing to look past if you will the defense yep. like if a big is able to stretch the floor 
um, at a decent level, that is more intriguing and more enticing to them than, you know, say an elite shot blocker. Uh, Cause offense is going to win you games in the current NBA. So him being able to shoot, I think masks any questions on defense as far as his current draft stock. All right, so there is, you're right, there's quite a few of those centers we see, you know, guys like, you know, Kelly Olenek getting significant minutes. Myers Leonard started nearly all year for the Heat as well. And realistically, their talent is going out there and, and shooting threes and uh, and doing stuff offensively versus doing it um, doing it a bit defensively. So there is room for that to, to grow. Um, the, the size of him, uh, the height is really good. I'm interested in uh, the, the strength because it wasn't something that really struck me. But you said, look, he's put on a little bit of weight here as well. So how's he looking strength-wise? Can he hold up against some of the bigger centers in the NBA? Yeah, and I think he will. And, and that's what that's what really struck me at first. You know, Matt and I were sitting in the gym in Vegas, and he, he cut his hair so he didn't have his dreads anymore. He walked in the gym in a wife beater, and I, I leaned over to Matt. And I said, who just walked in? I said, this dude is huge. Like, I don't know who that is. And he said, yeah, that's – that's Zeke. I did. I actually didn't recognize him when he walked in and he's one of the youngest guys in this class. Uh, and I just think he's only going to continue to grow and continue to fill out that frame. So I think he's got plenty of room to become, um, you know, an even more phenomenal athlete. So I had him going in the early part of the second round. I think pick 36 is where I had him. Like how high are you looking at, at Zeke in terms of if that shooting is real? Like, is he a guy that sneaks into the first round? Does he sneak into the top 20? Like, where are you looking with him? Yeah, I think top 20 is not out of the question. I think I'm very confident in saying first round. Uh, I, th I think somewhere in the 20s, if he gets there, is ultimately where he'll go. There, there are some teams that are very, very high. Okay, so let me just throw a couple of other sort of big man names at you who are around that area or around that area to me. Um, uh, Precious Achua, would you have him ahead of him? So we, we put Zeke one spot ahead of Precious in our mock draft. Okay. Um, who else have I got here in this area? Uh, Tyler Bay, not really a center, but you know, a power forward type. We have Bay uh, early second round. I think just the athleticism is awesome. Uh, the defense is awesome. I worry a little bit about the shot translating. It's a little bit flat. Um, and again, he's going to have to play the four. So we have him, we have him early in the second round. And the other one is someone who I covered on yesterday's show. Uh, I think it's an interesting comparison, Jalen Smith, who's rising up draft boards quite a bit at the moment. Would you have uh, Zeke or Jalen? So I would I would take Zeke, but Zeke and Jalen, I think, are the direct competition of one another. Yeah. I think a lot of these teams who are going to want to stretch center or stretch four in some capacity, the, choosing between them is the discussion that that team will have to have. And that that's going to be really interesting because, man, they're both really good and can shoot the ball. So... Well, we, we know there are some teams that are higher on Zeke, some on Jalen. Um, I couldn't tell you who's going to go first, but that's the competition for sure. It is going to be really interesting to see how this draft pans out. Lots of rotation-ish type players, and we're covering some of them here. Again, some of them you may not have really thought about too much. And uh, Derek, I thank you for coming on and chatting with me about those players. Give uh, give some of your stuff a plug and where people can find you. Yeah, for sure. Um, you can find me on Twitter at D Murray NBA, uh, D M U R R A Y N B A. And then connected to my account, you can find Babcock Hoops and Matt Babcock as well. We are always putting new draft stuff out there. Um, I recently put up a long piece about my trip to Miami where I was able to work or be in the gym with Desmond Bain and Kyra Lewis and a couple other guys for their uh, for their workouts and runs as well. So, Josh, again, I thank you so much for having me on. And, um, yeah, hope to do it again. No worries, Derek. Thank you for coming on. And go, uh, go follow Derek over on Twitter and check out the work that he has done. Thank you, Derek. All right, that'll do it for today's podcast. Don't forget, subscribe, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube. Tomorrow, we'll be back to look at some more prospects across the NBA draft. Let me work out exactly who we're talking about tomorrow. And I'll tell you, ah, Devin Vassell and the aforementioned Malachi Flynn are a couple of names who are going to be on tomorrow's show. So guys, subscribe. You know what to do. We are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya. See ya.